I've been involved in the dairy industry for 30 years as a dairy farmer's son and, and working through the industry. I'm also conscious that I live next door to quite a lot of steel workers. They work in red car. I'll let you think about that as I go through my presentation because they're not having meetings like this talking about how difficult it is. Theirs is really difficult. So one of the questions I'm going to pose to all of us is, how difficult is it? And is it actually a lot better than we think? I'm also conscious of the pig industry that I worked ra rather closely with during the, the late 90s. Now, for those that can't remember the pig industry, our government, bless it, brought in sow stall legislation uh, approximately 13 years earlier than the rest of the EU. This, is, this was not uh, EU legislation uh, that, that nobody else adopted. We adopted it early. And it took that industry down by over 50% in a matter of two years. So when we start and think about the dairy industry, I do just want us to think about those two very crystal, very clear differences. My fourth thing that I'm conscious about is where we are. We're in New Zealand House, ladies and gentlemen. I'm especially grateful to my friends in the embassy. I know one or two of them quite well. Thank you, Neil. And I just want to remind people about a result on Saturday. Now, you know they won. Actually, they were always going to win, if you think about it. Four and a half million people getting very focused about a game. Now, a game is a game, not an industry. But one might argue that those people involved in the game take it just as seriously as we do about dairying. Now, why did they win? Well, if you look at the population, we should have got to the semi-finals because we have the third largest population of, the, of, the, of, of all the countries that took part in the, in the Rugby World Cup. It should have been a final between the US and France. Bless it. But let's just think about what I've just said. A country with four and a half million people get really focused about something. Are they doing that about their dairy industry? I wonder. And when you think about what that policeman said after their win, and I'm going to quote verbatim, he happened to be the manager. He said, a few ordinary blokes played the game quite well. The understatement of the century. He said, they will look at the glory, they will take the glory, and then very quickly, they will start and analyze and find some uncomfortable truths and deal with them. Ladies and gentlemen, guess who's going to win the World Cup next time? And my point being is, if we want to get really serious about dairying, don't you think we've got to be as focused as our international competitors? And don't you think that we need to take it really seriously and find the very best in this industry? and then work out what, who our competitors are and move forward. I'm going to talk about what the best look like a little bit later in my presentation. But I've been asked this morning, and it's an absolute privilege to hear, to just look back a little bit. Bankers are great at looking back. So guess what? They've asked me to look, look back a little bit. And I'm going to take you through a little storyline which hopefully helps us understand why we are where we are now. So bear with me. I'm going to look at the changes that have taken place over the last 30 years. I'm going to talk about the Milk Marketing Board. If my grandfather was here, Jack, he would have been jolly delighted it was formed because he was selling milk in Stockton on Tees and not getting paid. He had 20 cows. He was considered a big dairy farmer at the time. 1933, we were producing three and a half billion litres of milk. That was an act of parliament formed by statute and it lasted 61 years. I'm going to talk about what happened in the milk board. His son, my, f my late father, uh, spent all his working life selling milk in the, in the milk board. My father's not here to defend himself, but if you asked him who he sold his milk to, he said the milk board. Did he know what the consumers were doing, the points that Chris has made? No, he didn't. 
How can you have an industry that doesn't know what the consumers want? Jack's grandson, John's oldest son, is stood talking to you now. My brother took on the farm. The one thing I've learned in my 27 years in the bank is you only do things when you think about consumers and customers. We don't always get it right. That's been a typical message in quite a lot of newsprint over the last few years. But I'll tell you here and now, the bank is probably thinking of something while I'm speaking to try and make its customer experience that little bit better. The day we don't think about customers is the day that actually we have less of a business. So the Milk Board had a, had a time scale that we've heard recently that the Milk Board should be brought back. Is it long live the king or is the king dead? Let's move on. I'll cover a little bit more about that in a minute. Why are we seeing all these issues in, in 2015? Well, I'll, I'll go through that a little bit further. What's happened with processing? Have there been some successes? What about the failures? What are the others doing? And how, how good a fix is this industry at the moment in order to move forward? I've given you a little bit of a hint of where I'm coming from in that already. So, the 1980s. Lots of excessive production, lots of regulation, lots of change in the milk board. Every time the milk board had to do something different uh, when I worked there, we needed basically an amendment to the 1933 Agriculture Act. Um, and, and just to remind people, the whole idea of that act was to collect milk, every single litre of milk, wherever it was produced, and at a constant cost. So it did discriminate the larger farm and it paid no reference to efficiency or the drive for what you would call advancement and commercialism. There was no commercialism whatsoever. Uh, the people that were in the board, and there's one or two of them in the room, might say, of course there was. Rubbish, there wasn't. Nothing like we see these days. And of course, you know, we heard about milk quotas in 1994. Actually, the Manshalt uh, uh, plan of 1968 in the EU was talking about constraining milk production. So if we're thinking that we need Europe or the government to give us the type of legislation to help us move forward, ladies and gentlemen, they move incredibly slowly. It took a decade and a half for that to happen. So let's, let's start and think how we're going to change this ourselves. Now, one of the things I want to try and bring across in this presentation is just where the milk industry was at the point of the introduction of milk quotas. Um, and you can see there, you know, average of just under 60 cows, um, around 16 billion litres of milk. But look at the EU difference, quite a variation on, on that, and a lot smaller farms. By the 1990s, uh, you know, the MMB was really struggling to keep pace with the changing market, the, the, the influence of Europe. And uh, of course, those that were involved in the milk industry in the early 90s, uh, we had vesting day virtually 21 years ago as of now. We had a successor co-op called Milkmark, many of you will remember it. And the smaller farmers with the uh, slightly less proportionate volume of milk signed up with that organization thinking that actually they needed to remember some of the issues around protection and making sure security of payment took place. Uh, but of course, as we know, um, that became a real, a real, uh, real differentiator. Only 10 years after the introduction of milk quotas, uh, over, over 13,000 milk producers had gone from the UK alone. Farm size had started to change and and we were still producing more or less the same amount of milk, noting that quotas had reduced um, the, the total by um, the uh, various cuts that were taking place. Once vesting day had taken place, instead of having one buyer of milk, there were 100 licenses issued. Today, I think there are around 60 licenses that, that, that buy milk. Uh, and of course, this word farm gate became crucial. Uh, this word farm gate became divisive and those with direct contracts to supply some of the commercial organizations that were buying milk were paying 
one or two pence more than, than the co-ops that were trying to achieve and, 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 and strive forward as they saw fit. We eventually saw the formation of, of three daughter co-ops, uh, the names of which are on the bottom of my slide, uh, and it's interesting. It, even, even from the year 2000, none of those co-ops are in existence now, and they had, to put it mildly, quite a checkered history from really successful to less than successful by some way. We're feeling the effects of some of the things now in 2015, principally because of the change in legislation and, and, uh, and, uh, and common agricultural policy actually nearly 10 years ago. Uh, I don't want to go through all of this slide, but this basically shows the amount of support that goes into the CAP, um, and it's in euros, and I just want to point out the really mustard, horrible colour which shows market in intervention. At the time of the introduction of milk quotas, intervention was a key marketplace for milk. So we were basically putting product into store without an end consumer. In fact, that actually was the consumer. By the time we got to the, the Fischler reform in, in 2005, there was very little paid in, in market support. Uh, we still have intervention buying, but the price is so low that actually it's market forces uh, th that, that come into play. And that's one of the things that is hitting hard now, if that's the view you wish to take. If you remember, I was talking about um, market intervention and I was talking about that horrible mustard coloured on there. Um, yes, there is some market intervention. Uh, yes, uh, it does come in, and you've heard a little bit from the Minister say in, in terms of how that works now, but it is now such at a low level that we are seeing the true impact of, of global forces and, uh, and global markets. I'm going to talk a, a lot more about those in a minute to pick up on some of the things that Chris said. But just to also point out that UK agriculture during the current regime of, of, of sort of cap uh, uh, implementation is probably going to receive 2.88 billion uh, per annum over the next five years. And that's not insubstantial. Um, and in terms of you know, our own milk producers, that's probably between one and twopence per litre uh, per annum. So it's not insignificant completely, but, but likewise it's not uh, the main differentiator between uh, you know, absolute profitability at this point in time. I did mention um, that the, um, you know, there was quite a change taking place, and, and I think this started to accelerate in the, in the early uh, 2000s, not, not only from the point of view that we had uh, you know, a massive and quite horrible outbreak of foot and mouth disease. I'll, I'll never forget it. And I know one or two people in the room won't either. And that gave many people not only the chance uh, through, um, if you like, ill fate to restock and think about where they wanted to take their own businesses. But I think it also gave the industry uh, a bit of a shock to, to start and think about, well, where was it going and how was it moving? And of course, we had things like the Curry Commission, uh, which, which uh, started to think about uh, you know, how, how agriculture could move forward. Um, we also had during that time, and Chris has mentioned it, you know, the evolution of, of, of a much more robust um, you know, milk processing industry, um, that there was several mergers and acquisitions that were taking place at that time, and, and the milk market became and started to look a lot more global uh, than it was, uh, or at least it seemed to, as, th as this dairy farmer's son saw it through the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and that's something that, that's, that's really picked up pace. Um, by the year 2005, and I'm sorry I couldn't find this exactly uh, on, in exactly the direct comparison um, with, with my earlier numbers, but you know, uh, we were still producing around 14 billion litres of milk. That we, we were under quarter, but that was limited by that. It was only on 21,000 farms by now. Um, and as you can see, you know, cow numbers and, and yield were starting to, starting to change. But just look at our European colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Not only the, the, the 15 member states that we were part of uh, up to that point, you know, far smaller herds. It was probably only Denmark that had larger uh, dairy herds uh, than, than anywhere else in, uh, in Europe than ourselves. But then, of course, we went and acquired, um, you know, a 10 further uh, member states um, and just look, at the, just look at the stats there. Their average herd size was four and a half cows. 
You know, so we are talking a co about a completely different metric uh, to even where uh, dairy farming had, had started in the UK when, when, when milk quotas came in. And I actually think that uh, during that decade, uh, markets became truly global. And we saw the evolution of, of some, uh, you know, truly amazing companies. And I've had the privilege of working with them uh, internationally. Um, you know, not only in Ireland, not only in Holland, um, Denmark, and of course, I can't forget that global giant that's uh, in, you know, in New Zealand, um, going back to where I'm stood now. Um, and, and those businesses are, you know, in my book, some of the best run businesses I've ever had anything to do with. Their, their, their management and their approach and their focus and their determination, going back to what I said about a certain, uh, a certain coach of a rugby union uh, team, uh, you know, the, the similarities are just so, so similar. Um, and, um, and of course, um, you know, matters evolved a little bit further. One little thing that I do just want to mention, and I'm sure you'll talk about it in the case study this afternoon, is, well, you know, how many dairy farmers should we have? And, and do we have a right that dairy farmers should, should stay and exist and, and be there forever? And, and dare I say, even, even suggest they're putting a museum. Um, now, you know, by this point in my little story in the UK, we'd lost over 60% of the dairy farmers that, we'd, that we had at the start of milk quarters uh, only in the, in the uh, early 80s. And if you go back far enough in the records, and I couldn't find exactly the year, but it was sometime after the establishment of the milk board, we'd have had 100,000 dairy farmers. I think there was about 125,000 when the milk board was established. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, that, that, that is something that socially you will debate in questions, and it's something that you'll think about, but because the dairy farmer is such a hub of the local community, local employment and everything else. In Europe, with those smaller farms that I've pointed out, you know, most countries, particularly in France and Germany, had lost over 75% of their dairy farmers by the same point in time. So, you know, we were starting to see some material change. And I think the one thing that, that became apparent to me, and I'm conscious my old boss is in the room, um, that, you know, and he'd say to me, well, why didn't you realise this earlier, Wilkinson? Um, you know, when you looked at dairy farms, those that were a little more efficient had slightly lower costs, had slightly bigger farms, had slightly more milk, and got a slightly better milk price. Actually, guess what? Made a lot more money. And that drive for size really became quite apparent at that point. Actually, when you look back, it had always been the case. But the efficiency and the size and the, and, and, and the price of milk really started to drive the difference. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, um, we had the demise, well, we had the formation, and, and then we had the demise of dairy farmers of Britain. Um, now, just to pick up on Jack, John, and John Allen, we lost money in that co-op. That co-op failed not because it was a co-op, it failed, in my view, in hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, because actually it had average, at best, management. And, and you know, the type of thing I'm trying to highlight to you is that average management doesn't get you anywhere. Being average is not what gets me out of bed. Uh, I try every morning to be the best. I don't always achieve that. But when I see the businesses, and I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end of my presentation about what the best businesses are achieving, then I think that's something that we've got to really start and think about. And that's why I mentioned the Rugby World Cup. They won because they were the best. It wasn't a fluke. They worked at it for four years. And those businesses I've touched on internationally are achieving what they're doing because they've been doing it for decades. And if, it's, if this is the day that we draw the line and start focusing about being the best, then in 10 years' time we'll have an amazing uh, industry and it'll be one that we'll be really proud of. Of course, and you've heard this from Liz herself, we've seen massive investment in the dairy industry. And one of the reasons why I'm so confident about where we are at the moment is that in my view there's been over 250 million pounds invested in dairy processing here in the UK. I would have to go back a long time, uh, up to 2010, to add up the, the number that came to 250 million. Uh, and we know that there's been many, many things that have been, uh, you know, invested not just with Arla, Muller, but even Dairy Crest and, and uh, you know, people like Wensleydale Creamery. They've done some really exciting things. So we've, we're now in a really strong place. Of course, with the sale of the milk business 
um, to Muller Wiseman, we'd probably have a duopoly of, of milk processing. But if we think about it, um, doorstep deliveries were at 40% of, of liquid milk sales in the mid 1990s, they're barely 3% now. So we've got to think about convenience. Co op, uh, the, the retail uh, outlet said that milk was the most convenient product they sold in 1965. In the year 2015, that is still true. So let's get on and live with it. And it's great to hear that we now have more types of cheese than the French. You know, so let's, let's start and think about these things. Uh, you know, when I worked in the milk board, there was probably one type of cheese. And it was in plastic blocks like this, and it was called cheddar. And probably quite variable. So the position now, ladies and gentlemen, is one of you know, where we've got global supply exceeding growing global demand. That's why we've got low prices. And until that, that supply and demand changes, then actually we're going to see the type of environment we've got uh, for a little while. We've got, you know, I, I do disagree slightly with what the Minister has said. If you look at the last five years, we do have a growing deficit uh, in value terms of milk products here in the UK. Now, you know, um, I, I'm doing quite a bit of work in the food industry at the moment. In Europe, the UK food industry is the biggest by some distance. The biggest food industry by some distance. We invest more in new products in this country than Germany and France put together. I'm talking to food businesses that have a simple strategy about their international outlook. They want to work here because it's the most sophisticated market in the world and it's the one that brings most return and yes, it's the most challenging. They want to work in the US because that's the biggest and they want to work in China because that's going to be the biggest. Stop. That still involves the UK. So we, you know, if they're thinking like that, then I think um, the UK dairy industry needs to as well. I do agree with Chris Walkland. The balance between what the young and the older are consuming is something we need to think about. And as we have falling milk consumption uh, and rising uh, you know, processed products, that does allow uh, our international competition to sell product here. That's something we shouldn't be fearful of. It's something we should rise to and, and face on and, and compete with. I just put up the, the figures of where we are now in terms of uh, herd size, uh, number of producers. Uh, do I think that we'll ever stop the fall in producers? No, probably we won't. Uh, but what we've got to make sure is that those that want to stay in it are the best globally. This is about thinking as a global exporter rather than working out how you, how you compete in the county or in the parish. The competition is abroad, uh, not here. And, and you know, we now have seen the full fledging of the internationally oriented, orientated exporting business. Ask a Dane, ask an Irishman, ask a, a Kiwi what they do about trading products. They are looking constantly at the international markets. We have a magazine in this country called The Dairy Farmer. The same thing in New Zealand is called Dairy Exporter. Clues in the title. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you plenty to think about, but I just want to end on a few things about what I think is personal views about what the best businesses do in agriculture. And I make no bones about this. I, I've studied the, the sector for uh, nearly three decades now, and I think I, uh, I've had the privilege of seeing some absolutely, truly amazing businesses. They aren't good at one thing, they are good at everything, particularly at sorting out their weaknesses. Those inconvenient facts that, that, that Steve Hansen talked about. Their management is the differentiator. You can go to a bad farm and see a really good farmer do a, doing a brilliant job. Likewise, you can go to a good farm and see in a virtual mess. It's about the management. Unfortunately, the best farms make the most money. That means they have the lowest costs of operation. That is a key differentiator. There is no excuse for it. Businesses with high costs hardly make any money in the good times and lose the most in the, in the worst times. And it's about making sure you make the most money in the good times and that's a key resilience for the poorer times. Go and talk to a pig farmer. They will describe that eloquently. They are financially savvy. You're going to talk about that this afternoon. That might be an inbre inbred skill. There are some dairy farmers that are superb at being financially savvy. 
Others have been trained. Both are right. They build cash in the good times and they expand and drive their business with cash in mind. They know who their competitor is and they know what they've got to do next in order to make sure that they remain at least equal to them. And they are relentless about improvement. Now, one thing that Steve Hansen said was that he, he looked at the Spanish football team, which has won everything in, in the last five years, and they, in effect, lost the plot. And what they stopped doing was focusing on that relentless uh, activity of seeking out about being the best. They actually, he didn't use the word, but they became comfortable. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not be comfortable. Let's make sure that it is really challenging and that we make the most of those challenges. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm for one really up for it. Thank you very much.